Hello sewing people of the internet. In this video at long last I'm going to do a review of this Kenmore sewing machine. I'm going to be presenting some foundational information at the beginning of this video. If you need to skip ahead there's chapter markers but uh, it took me a while to embrace this machine and I want to explain a little bit about that. I will say right up front if you're watching this video because you've found one of these for sale and you're asking whether or not you should buy it as a first machine for doing make your own gear stuff, uh, the answer is yes, you should buy it if it's at a good price and in good shape and all that normal caveats. Uh, this seems to be a, a fantastic example of the kind of machine I recommend people start out with, a vintage domestic machine. So I'll explain a little bit about why uh, as we go through the video. So. One of the reasons why I have not really embraced Kenmore machines, they have a fantastic reputation among their fans. Uh, they, they're supposed to be really good machines, but uh, their nomenclature is very confusing to me. And, you know, Kenmore is the brand of the department store Sears in the United States, and they never manufactured any of their stuff, uh, certainly not sewing machines anyway. Uh, and all of their machines were made by different manufacturers throughout the years. So one machine may not be as good as another machine. Uh, I honestly don't know if you know any of them are, are particularly bad, uh, but this one was manufactured by a Japanese company called Maruzen, and later that company marketed their products as Jaguar machines. And they apparently have a very good reputation for making high quality machines and this is a well regarded machine to my understanding. Uh, the problem with the nomenclature is that this machine it has a model number of 158.17520 and I guess it's just known as the 1752 that 1752 part of that number uh, doesn't stick out easily in my memory or roll off the tongue like a Singer 201 or a, I don't know like the Touch and Sew or um, I don't know, it seems like most of the other sewing machine brands that I'm familiar with have three digit numbers and maybe that's the uh, extent of my capacity to remember things. But I mean honestly I get confused with some of the Singer uh, three digit numbers trying to remember which one is which. But uh, I feel like if this was the Kenmore Dragon I would remember that better and be able to differentiate the different models easier than uh, there's a whole series of 158 machines and with different numbers after the dot and then there's a bunch of other different prefix models so it just is confusing to me and I, I don't like that um, so I, I've not really followed these machines or gotten to know their history very well until I got this machine. So I suppose I should tell you how this machine came uh, into my possession. Um, I was at a thrift store uh, probably it might be over a year ago now. I don't remember exactly how long ago it was, but my wife and I were at a thrift store and I saw this sitting looking beautiful and they had a pretty high price on it. I think they had a, a price tag of over $100 for it, maybe like $125, but it was missing the foot pedal. And uh, I had a long talk with the manager of the place and I was like, you know, most people aren't going to buy this machine and you know, have to buy a foot pedal and not know if it works and stuff because the foot pedal is also the power cord with most machines of this vintage. And uh, anyway, I negotiated a deal on it. I think I paid $30 for it. I've discussed in other videos my opinions about sewing machine prices, especially vintage sewing machines. This is a fine machine and I, I think probably $50 is probably fair. Uh, I don't know, about over $100, unless you really knew you wanted it or if it was in pristine condition. This one looks pretty nice, but it's uh, it's not perfect. It's got some, some discoloration and stuff. This is the uh, coveted MYOG model. Uh, no, I put that sticker on there. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I, I, Tim, I tried to give you a shout out in another video and that didn't work out, but if you're not familiar with Learn MYOG, uh, if you're at all interested in making your own gear, uh, which is what MYOG stands for, then you should check out Tim's site. He does some amazing uh, patterns and really well thought out patterns for people who you know want to learn how to sew stuff and maybe don't know how to make it themselves yet. His site is well worth checking out. Anyway, uh, so yeah, so that's what that sticker is all about. 
So let's talk a little bit about the basics of this machine. My understanding is it was built in 1968 or 69, so it falls perfectly into my sort of arbitrary pre-1970 preference. Uh, it's a class 15 bobbin machine. So it uses the same class 15 bobbin as the Sailrite machines and all the machines that look just like them, the Singer 237, and a host of other sewing machines. It's a very common bobbin size. I, I like that. I've mentioned in previous videos that one of the reasons why I favor my Singer 237 is it uses the class 15 bobbin and that makes it a good match for my Sailrite machines. So if I need a non-walking foot machine, I can swap bobbins back and forth, or I can just have a whole bunch of the same size bobbin and not have to worry about which machine they go to. So if you, especially if you aren't an idiot like me and have 30 machines, if you just want to have a couple of sewing machines, having them all be the same bobbin has some potential advantages. And class 15 uh, is the largest, I think, domestic size bobbin and probably the best choice for something like it, especially if you have a, a sailrite as well. Anyway, so this is a class 15 bobbin machine. To the best of my knowledge, it's an all metal machine as far as the internal gearing. It does have the ability to use embroidery or decorative stitch cams. This machine did not come with any cams. That's not something that's terribly important to me. But if it's something that you want to use the machine for, then if you're buying one used, you might want to make sure that it comes with the cams. I imagine they're probably available on eBay and places like that, but I haven't really looked. Since it uses the uh, embroidery cam system, it's a pretty safe bet that this is a zigzag machine, and it in fact is and it has a control to drop the feed dogs for darning and embroidery, you know, freehand embroidery type stuff. The machine has a switch for the light and that is also the power button. So with the power button on, the machine will run. And with that button turned off, I'm stepping on the pedal, the machine does not run. It's a fairly simple machine in terms of controls. There's zigzag, the control for the uh, using the cams or for darning. The first setting here has kind of a zigzag looking stitch. That's the setting for normal sewing and that's probably all I'll ever use for it. So You have a uh, up for reverse lever and also to adjust the stitch length. Bottom winder on the top. Two spool pins for spools. I'm running an industrial cone. I've just got a, a thread stand back here with a cone of V69 thread. Probably the most interesting control mechanism on the machine is the presser foot pressure adjustment. You uh, release the pressure, there's a collar around the shaft and if you push down on this collar then the shaft pops up and that's the lowest amount of foot pressure and then you just push down on the shaft to reach the desired pressure that you want and you go all the way down the manual recommends about halfway down as a good starting point. Uh, there's no real fine like numerical control over this. It's more of a feel thing, which I kind of prefer myself. But it's just an interesting way. Usually it's just like a screw or something that I've seen. So that's, that's kind of a neat way to do it. This machine did not come with a manual when I purchased it. But uh, I was able to find one from the Sewing Dude blog that I was able to download. So that's awesome that he has that. So there's one feature about this machine that really blew me away when I first discovered it. And that is the really impressive presser foot lift height. Your typical domestic sewing machine of this vintage, you can raise the presser foot and then push up a little bit more to get a little bit extra height to get that extra thick piece of material under it. Well this one goes way the heck up. Like the needle is stopping this now more than the presser foot. That's a standard big lighter. That's really, really impressive. Now that's a super impressive feature and I could see that being incredibly handy, 
But I just want to caution you that just because the foot can be lifted that high doesn't mean that it can sew that thickness of any material. The advantage for that, and honestly, this is one thing I wish that the Sailrite had. The advantage of that is that you can lift the foot over an already assembled seam or portion of a bag or something you're doing a repair on that's already put together and get that thick, you know, part. Not You're not trying to sew, just get it, you know, out of the way under the foot so you can get to where you do want to sew. I can't tell you how many times that would have been helpful to me uh, on a repair or, you know, finishing the assembly of a, a big bag or something. So that's a really helpful feature. I wish more machines had it, but just don't be misled by thinking, you know, if you stop the video here and don't go any farther, this thing isn't gonna sew, a, you know, three quarters of an inch thick stack of leather. So what will it sew? Uh, so we're gonna do some sewing demonstrations with it shortly. The reason I advocate using a vintage domestic sewing machine, especially as your first machine for someone who wants to make their own gear is Vintage machines are quite capable, very toughly built, long-lasting machines, and they're capable of sewing some pretty thick assemblies of heavier fabrics and even some leathers. I wouldn't necessarily try to make a very complicated assembly like a backpack with number 10 waxed canvas and inner tubes or 1680 denier ballistic nylon. You could probably do it, but it would be a challenge to do with a machine like this. Any non-walking foot machine, honestly, it would be a challenge to do that with. But I think this is a great machine to get started learning how to sew, making some projects. You could make a lot of really cool, especially stuff on the more ultralight end of the spectrum for you know camping and hiking gear, uh, camping hammock, things like that. You could do a lot of that kind of stuff with this machine, and you could do some heavier stuff too. And then when you get to the point where you're ready for a walking foot machine to do heavier projects, this is always there to do those decorative stitches or lighter materials or sub-assemblies that you don't need the walking foot machine for. So this is a great example of where to start. If you're thinking about buying a vintage domestic sewing machine and you're confused by all the different machines that are available and you're not sure what machine to buy, uh, I recently learned about a resource that might be helpful to you. Heath over at 77 Gear Company. Uh, he has a, a blog and you can find him on Instagram. I'll put some links in the description. He's come up with a really interesting scorecard of sewing machines where he ranks a lot of vintage and not so vintage domestic machines uh, based on his perception of their utility in a number of different categories. It's a really useful tool, uh, particularly if you've found a machine and you want to kind of see where it ranks compared to other machines. I will say there's some machines that aren't on his list that I am very fond of, but his criteria are slightly different from mine. And there's a lot of machines on his list that I don't have any familiarity with. But in general, uh, I think the process that he has applied to evaluating machines uh, seems very sound and it seems like a really useful tool. So if you're confused about choosing a vintage sewing machine, I highly recommend you check it out. So let's see how it sews. In case you were wondering, it's a steel machine. I'm gonna change to some standard household polyester thread. This machine's very easy to thread. And it's a good thing it's easy to thread because I forgot to wind a bobbin. I haven't mentioned this in a while, but in case you're new to this, when you have a bobbin case like this, if you hold the bobbin case in your left hand, hold the bobbin in your right hand with the spool going over and away from you, and then drop the bobbin in, and that aligns it where it needs to be in the correct direction. So I've got some, I think this is 1.1 ounce, I forget, uh, Sil Poly. I'll just start sewing together a couple of layers of that.
The stitch length is pretty short, shorter than I think it would be on a different fabric. This, this fabric slides so much. Just for laughs, I'm going to try increasing the uh, foot pressure and see if that makes any difference. Tension's a little high, I need to adjust that, but uh, that made the stitch length a lot more consistent. I'm not going to mess with this a lot to try to perfect the stitch on this particular fabric, but this machine would definitely be a good choice on a lightweight uh, tent or tarp or hammock or that kind of project. Yesterday I was doing some testing on this uh, apparel cotton fabric, uh, something you might make a shirt or something out of. So. Let's try a zigzag stitch on this. Probably see I did some with some V69 yesterday and now I'm gonna use this regular household style thread. Could maybe stay in a little tension adjustment, but it works well. So again, for doing apparel alterations, uh, or making other projects out of this kind of fabric, uh, this machine would be an excellent choice. This has nothing really to do with this model of machine in particular, but I do want to point out on my particular table that came with this machine, the leaf that makes the extension when you open the table isn't, it's not level. I don't know if anybody out there, I'm basically saying this, if you know how to fix that, uh, I, I don't know, I can come up with a way to improvise something that will make it be level again, but it's not going to be correct, but anyway. On the subject of tables, another reason why I have not really embraced the Kenmore machines is their footprint is completely different from the Singer footprint. And I've mentioned this before, but my Sailrite has the same footprint as the Singer machines. So I have tables that I can use, Singer machines or the Sailrite. I've put my Foff uh, 260 into a Singer table. It doesn't fit perfectly, but it can, it can work. Uh, so having multiple machines and not necessarily having the room for a table for every single machine, it's advantageous to me to have uh, one table that can fit many machines and the Kenmore does not fit into that. Now it's also true that many of my other Singer machines and other brands of machines that I have also don't fit that footprint. So that's not exclusive to this machine. Uh, I've spoken before, you know, about if I had to get down to two machines, what would they be? And it's been my Singer 237 and my Sailrite Ultrafeed, at this point probably the LSZ one, not the LS one. And that's still the case because I could put them both in the same table and they, I get the most use out of those two machines uh, covering the widest span of materials. So, and, and this machine is probably maybe a better machine than the 237. It's, they're at least comparable, but this not fitting into the same table footprint as the Sailrite would make me lean back towards the 237. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that if you're looking at one of these machines, just know that, especially if you buy one without a table, it's not going to fit in anything but a Kenmore table, to the best of my knowledge. All right, I've got some 1000D Cordura nylon, and I'm going to fold a double hem. So that's three layers. It's a pretty reasonable amount. We'll see how it does. Use a little more top tension. But yeah, a little tension adjustment will have it perfect, but that's very nice, no issues at all. Uh, this is not a terribly difficult fabric for most domestic sewing machines to sew. 
uh, I think the confusing thing for most people is it's easy to sew a flat hem in this material. It gets a little bit more difficult when the layers start adding up and the structure becomes more complex. But uh, for doing simple things with this fabric, not a problem at all for this machine. You may have also noticed by now, this machine is quite fast. The motor on this machine is a 1.2 amp motor. That's a little bit more powerful than most domestic sewing machines of this vintage. In comparison, the Mighty Singer 201, a legendary machine, has a motor rated to 0.6 amps, or half the power of the Kenmore 1752. And just for the sake of comparison, here's the Singer 201 sewing the same 1000D Cordura at its top speed. One of the reasons I advocate having a vintage domestic machine with zigzag as part of your arsenal is if you have a straight stitch only industrial walking foot machine or a sailrite that you don't, if you don't have the LSZ that you use primarily for assembling your heavier uh, projects. But if you want to do a bar tack, then you need a zigzag machine. I think technically it's, we're simulating a bar tack when we do this, but you get the idea. So a bar tack is a row of straight stitches overlapped with zigzag stitches back and forth. And there are different standards that have some number of stitches you have to do and what the width has to be and stuff. But for our purposes, you know, a bar tack is just a bar tack. So, Let's see if I can do a usable bar tack on this 17337 webbing. I use this webbing a lot on backpack straps and it's the webbing that's used for molly attachments. And I'll just sew it to the two layers of 1000D Cordura. That seems like a pretty reasonable test. So first we'll just do a straight stitch. And then we'll switch to zigzag and I'll shorten up the stitch length a little bit. And we'll go in reverse, and then forward, and I forgot to put thread back on the machine because I took it off to put on the other machine, so we'll just stop there. And that's just a quick demonstration. I could clean that up a little bit, but that's a perfectly adequate bar tack. And it's Definitely not easily coming off up there, just for fun. <clears throat> All right, I imagine if I keep trying, I can get that to come off, but obviously that's pretty secure. So I just want to demonstrate one more advantage of the stupefyingly high foot lift on this machine. I do want to caution you though, you should only use this method for non-load bearing applications, decorative things like if you want to hang a potted plant from a tree or something like that. Uh, this makes a very strong connection, but this probably isn't the machine or the thread to do it with. But uh, I have some rope here that I want to make a fixed loop with. So I'm going to take advantage of that foot lift I can just lift the foot high enough to get this rope underneath the presser foot and then sew it together with a zigzag stitch. By the way, full confession, I had a hard time getting this to work and I had done it before and was wondering why it was not working as well this time and uh, the problem was I had the presser foot pressure all the way down from when I was doing that ripstop nylon at the beginning of the video and it needed the presser foot pressure to be much less for this thick rope. Uh, in general, according to the manual for this machine, uh, you want less pressure for thicker fabrics and more pressure for thinner fabrics. So, I learned something. So, there you have it. That's my impression of the Kenmore 1752 or 158.17520 uh, Marozen made machine. 
obviously the spectrum of Kenmore machines is very wide and again they're manufactured by several different manufacturers so uh, you know if you find a different era Kenmore made by a different manufacturer then your mileage may vary but everything I've heard about them has been good and people who like them tend to really like them. It took me a while to warm up to this machine. I've had it for quite some time. You've seen it in other videos and uh, at first I honestly didn't really love it but it's really starting to grow on me and uh, I think it's going to get more regular use in, in my rotation of machines. I think if you're looking for your first vintage domestic machine, you're trying to get started in making your own gear, this would be an excellent choice if you find one. I see them pretty regularly now on uh, Marketplace and stuff. I probably saw them before but didn't pay attention to them. Now that I have one, I've seen them several times. I've almost bought a second one just to have as a spare, I guess. I've seen them priced between $25 and $50 and then occasionally some moron is trying to get $1,000 for them. But uh, I think if you find one for the, you know, under $100 price range, you're probably going to be pretty happy with it. I hope you found that helpful. If you did, clicking the like button is always a nice thing to do. If you're not a subscriber, I'd love it if you would subscribe to my channel. There's a bunch of links to stuff in the description below. You can follow me on Instagram and also check out my second channel if you're even remotely interested in fishing or other outdoor stuff that I do. And if you have any questions or comments, post them in the comments section. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Oh, look at you. Oh, don't come off, don't come off, don't come off. Okay. Ah, no, 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 no. Oh, geez, go, buddy, go. Ah. Oh, I hope you got to see that. <laughs> That's my snook on my $45 Zepco.